Many of us are uncomfortable with most organized religions. Not all of us feel the peace and ease of those who have so easily slipped into the traditional beliefs of these faiths. Christianity in particular has some insistent enemies out there, and they are, in many instances, well-deserved. Christianity has caused harm in the world in tandem with its service to humanity. It's a complicated thing to ask deep questions of a faith that on one hand extols the virtues of unconditional love, while at the same time mets out the punishment of exclusion and judgment with the other. Of course, this all depends upon which denomination you're talking about. But even those who profess the most hate have good people within them. Be careful not to paint things with too broad a brush. But like all holistic faith systems, and even some of the newer ones, they all focus primarily on the establishment of good and peaceful relationships. Relationships with others, with the earth, with a higher power, and with ourselves. These are the four relationships upon which nearly all religious thinking is based. Mastering them is a doorway to unimagined ease, safety, resiliency, and fulfillment. May we hold these thoughts in our hearts as we proceed through our time together. Light begets light. Love invites love. Truth reveals truth. Justice gives rise to justice. May this small flame burn throughout the heavens around us and the earths within, and may we evermore be changed by its presence. There is a thought in mainstream Christianity that we are all sinners. It's a fascinating one to me. Now, I understand where the idea originates, but I'm disturbed that the value and orientation of it shifted from divine advice to that of divine command. The Ten Commandments were not commands, but divine sayings or utterances, depending on whether you're speaking of the Greek or Hebrew words for what became translated into English as commands. So let's ratchet back a notch or two, the weight and gravitas of the implications of our use of the word sin. It's not to say we shouldn't be considering the topic, but we should be looking at it through a different lens if we wish to make use of the advice. We have given the word sin, not 
too much power, but the wrong kind of power. When you look at the instances of things which are described in Scripture as being sinful, there is a pattern to them. They are all about relationship. Adultery is a good example. Committing adultery with a neighbor is a break in two different relationships at the same time, that with your spouse and with your neighbor whose spouse you slept with. You are now not only less safe under your own roof, you are less safe in your own neighborhood. The block party becomes nothing but drama. Christianity is a relational practice, as Jesus taught it. The biggest thing you can do wrong is anything which works against the idea of being in good and right relationship with others. How else shall we know world peace if not by fostering and creating relationships as widely and deeply as possible? That is the whole point of the Dharma of Christianity, which Jesus and other spiritual prophets taught. When it is said that, quote, the wages of sin are, is death, what kind of death do they mean? We know that we didn't burst into flames upon the spot where we committed our last sin, so it's not physical death we're discussing. Death of the soul, perhaps? That would be a fairly arrogant claim to make with any certainty. The type of death being discussed must be of a different sort. I won't presume to know what with any authority. Others shouldn't either. So let's leave that article aside, since an accurate interpretation is impossible. The sin of breaking or preventing relationship is expressed through the four types of relationships we have. They are with others, the earth, with the self, and with God or a higher power. When you do anything to prevent or destroy your relationship with any of these four things, you are doing some level of harm. How cumulative that harm becomes depends on the type of harm you're doing. Throwing your trash out the car window is a sin of one degree. Belching black smoke from a tailpipe is another. Both have a cumulative effect, however, of causing death. A heavy wage to pay indeed. But in all likelihood, a broken relationship is not naturally a permanent state. It is something which must be maintained by choice. We have to choose to keep being unforgiving as if we were constantly holding down a button. Once we lift our finger off the button, things return to equilibrium on their own. If we are all connected in ways we can't see, that connection is not likely broken by acting in ways that we can. In other words, don't give yourself so much credit that you think you have the ability to destroy any relationship at all on the truest level of our existence. You don't have the power to truly separate yourself from God. You just think you do. And so you're afraid of your own power, which doesn't exist anyway. Likewise, if we are all eternal beings, then we're all likely friends backstage, even if we enact a fight scene on stage. Don't be fooled by the drama. So the advice then, which has been unfortunately translated into a command, is to seek to physically emulate the natural equilibrium of our soul. First, remember that no break in relationship is permanent. After death, we are not likely to hold on to a grudge. Of course, I have no objective proof of this but it is an article of my faith by which I choose to live my life. The problem often becomes interpreting what we think God's beliefs are about us. We put human glasses on God's eyes and expect it to live up to our expectations. It won't. We have virtually no basis to understand the mind or viewpoint of God. Ergo, it must not be for us to try. It must be that we are meant to look towards something a bit closer to the ground to understand what God might want for us. What might constitute a break in relationship with God? It's not atheism. If we were to only use scripture to get a picture of God or what God might be, you must recognize that in scripture, God does not actually punish. God recalibrates. That it is a punishment is entirely speculative. The writers of scripture always assume that bad happens because God is punishing us, but if that's the case, God isn't paying very careful attention. 
since bad stuff worthy of punishment happens all the time. Why did God pick Sodom and not so many other things? For instance, why did God allow the Crusades and the Inquisition? Those were crimes against humanity and terrorism committed by the church itself. If God punishes, why did it not punish the church for that? And what of the genocide against Native Americans and slavery? Aren't those things worthy of punishment? Recalibration feels like utter destruction, but really it's just change. That we would be given an opportunity to create a state of balance closer to that which is natural for us on the soul level. It is not a break in our relationship with God. Recalibration is a strengthening of it. To me, this means we may curse about, complain to, reject, or become frustrated with God. We may even declare our hatred for it, but that doesn't mean it works both ways. A wise mother knows when her child is only saying, I hate you, because they're mad or afraid. A wise mother knows how to read between the lines. We should give God more credit. A break in our relationship with God is only about how we pinch ourselves off from something which is eternally there for us. And we do that by disavowing our connectivity with all that's around us. We pretend to break a relationship that is unbreakable, and it's the pretending itself, which is like eating a little bit of poison every day. We take negative actions and make bad choices when we forget how we are all connected. That's what a sin really is. And the hell is of our own making. We love to say about our own behavior that it's not hurting anybody. Drug abuse in particular is a sin in that it harms our relationship with the self. At the same time, it has the potential to harm our relationships with our friends and loved ones. The Buddhists suggest we do no harm. The pagans say, and no harm comes, so mote it be. Too often we interpret that to mean, as long as we're not harming anything or anybody other than ourselves. But self-destructive behavior is a grave sin, for it is virtually impossible to be in good relationship with others when we think so little of ourselves. Our relationship with the earth is one of the most fragile and important relationships our biology has. There is literally no line where the earth ends and we begin. We are physically and literally a part of it. No atom in our bodies is new. The molecules which make up me are not new. They once belonged exclusively to the earth and to the stars before that. What we do to the earth, we are ultimately doing to ourselves. It's hard to quantify the type of destruction we are capable of doing to the earth because you can't see the forest through the trees. We are so close to it and our little destructions are so individually small that we become accustomed to the damage which increasingly exists around us. We have fooled ourselves into thinking our harm is of no consequence, but all words, all actions, all thoughts have consequences. Some small, some large, some good, some bad. You have a power that you do not realize you possess. Use it for good. Be at ease now and breathe. Sink into your seat ever so gently as you continue to allow the air to flow effortlessly in and out. So much of the time we struggle with who we are in the world. We struggle with what we mean to other people. We struggle with what other people mean to us. As you breathe, look back into your mind's eye. Look to find a mirror behind you. As you turn, you think for a moment that you do not know the person you are looking at. For a moment, you forget that it's a mirror and not a window, looking out at someone else. When suddenly, like a flash, you realize that you are looking at yourself. But this view of yourself is not a view you have ever held before. 
you look different. Almost the way an audio recording of your voice sounds different than the voice you hear yourself. But what makes it different from an audio recording of your own voice is that you find yourself immensely glad with what you see in the reflection. You see your humanity. You see your divine spark. You see someone looking back at you with care and understanding. It is like nothing you've ever looked at before. As you continue to look, you can see that the being before you is many layered. Layer upon layer of color and light formed into the shape of a person. Formed into a being of light walking this earth with purpose, with intent, with compassion. You begin to realize this is who you really are and you welcome it. In your heart, you embrace this figure before you and you know deep inside it embraces you back. Your thoughts are received by them as a request and a welcome. And breathe. Unable to turn away from the view, the figure in the mirror begins to speak to you, not so much with words, but communicating deeply nonetheless. It speaks to you on a different level, saying to you, All shall be well. You are on the right track. Exactly where you should be right now. There is no such thing as wasted time or wasted effort. No amount of love is insignificant and you are made of it. There is nothing to you but love. Take heart. Take heed. You already have everything you will ever need. Knowing that your time with this image is at an end, with warmth and affection you bow deeply. With gratitude your heart expands. You turn away from the mirror, but the image of your true self will never leave you, never abandon you. It will always be a part of your consciousness evermore. Take one final breath and return.